Hello, everyone. I am Rahul Gosain. And I'm Rohit Gosain. And we are Oncology Brothers. Another phenomenal San Antonio Breast Cancer Symposium is now in the books. There was a lot of data presented here, but today we have Dr. Sarah Tulaney from Dana Farber to focus on one particular study, the HER2 CLIMB O2 study, looking at metastatic HER2 positive breast cancer disease. Sarah, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, thank you so much for having me. Welcome, Sarah. Sarah, before we dive into the HER2 CLIMB 2 study, it is important to lay the foundation where we stand in stage four setting for HER2 positive advanced metastatic patient population. Initially, in first line setting, we do THP, which is taxane based regimen along with HER2 directed therapy. On disease progression, we have a choice of TDXD or triplet to catinib, trastuzumab, and capecitabine. Though TDM1 used to be part of our second line regimen, but that got kicked out to the third line after the approval of TDXD and the triplet regimen. Now, with HER2 CLIMB 2 study, that has come back in action with a combination. So Sarah, if you don't mind talking about the HER2 CLIMB 2 study design and what did it show for its findings? Sure, um, so HER2 CLIMB 2 is trying to look to see if adding to catnib to TDM1 would improve progression-free survival, not just in an all-comer population of patients who have metastatic HER2 positive disease, but it also importantly included patients who could have brain metastases, so they could have active brain mets or stable treated brain mets, or could have no brain mets uh, and be included in this trial. Uh, and this was really a trial for patients who had progressed on a prior taxane and trastuzumab. So the majority of patients were entering the trial in the second line setting. There were very few patients, so I think about 12% of the first line, uh, and then uh, some in the third line and beyond. But again, the majority were, were second line patients. And the primary endpoint of this study was progression-free survival. What we saw was that adding to catnib to TDM1 did significantly improve progression-free survival. So it had an absolute delta between the two arms of about two months. Um, so going from you know, a little over seven months to about nine and a half months. Uh, and then amongst the patients who had brain metastases, which was about 40% of the population, there was also an improvement in PFS going from 5.7 to 7.8 months. So again, about a two month difference. We did not, however, see the data broken up by patients who had active brain mets versus stable treated brain mets. And at this time, the overall survival data is very immature. So, you know, we don't have the level of data, for example, that we have had for with HER2 CLIMB, which had looked at the capecitabine to catnib trastuzumab triplet, uh, again, just with the maturity of the data being a bit more limited. So again, really a positive study and improvement in PFS. The delta was not huge, um, but, you know, certainly a, still a, a positive study, suggesting that this combination is, you know, at least additive, if not synergistic. Sarah, thanks for going over that. But there are a few things that I want to reiterate. HER2 positive disease has the highest incidence of CNS disease when it comes to breast cancer, hormone receptor, triple negative, or again here, uh, HER2 positive. And historically, these patients were excluded from clinical trials, right? But it is so good to see high enrollment of CNS positive disease. We would love to see more granular data saying treated versus active. And then, of course, looking at the data, there's a robust CNS activity here, which is very encouraging. Yeah, I mean, your point is really important. You know, we know in someone's lifetime, this metastatic HER2 positive disease, about 50% of patients will have brain metastases. And it's so critical that HER2 climb really changed our paradigm. As you said, people were usually excluded if they had brain metastases, but it is so critical to understand how these drugs work in the CNS. And we learned that from HER2 CLIMB, and it was really nice to see that HER2 CLIMB 2 also included patients who, who could have even had an active brain metastasis. So I'm really interested to learn more about how those patients with active brain meds do and obviously see the totality of more mature data to see if there is a survival advantage in this particular combination. Absolutely. So Sarah, coming, in, coming back to this algorithm, in your clinic now, potentially three options, TDXD, versus doublet to catenib with TDM1 or triplet to catenib with capecitabine and trastuzumab. Who is going to get what? Okay, good question. It's nice to have choices, uh, but I will say that, you know, I, I very much agree that THP is our first line standard. I will say for almost all patients, 
TDXD is really the second line standard. I mean, seeing a 28 month PFS in Destiny Breast 03, that is unprecedented. It is four times longer than TDM1. And it even we're seeing data that it is even working in patients with brain metastases. Obviously we don't have phase three data with an OS um, endpoint like HER2 climb demonstrate a significant improvement in OS in the brain map patients, but now we've seen even the pooled analysis from the DESTINY trials. Uh, we've seen some smaller trials like Tuxedo and Deborah suggesting robust, you know, about 50% CNS response intracranially, which is confirmed in the pooled analysis. So I will say I'm pretty comfortable with TDXD for almost all of my patients' second line. I am typically, though, using the capecitabine to catnip trastuzumab regimen third line for most patients. And so here now, as you point out, there's this conundrum. Let's pretend TDM1 to catnip gets an approval uh, based on HER2 climb 2 How would we pick and choose? I think I probably would still stick with the capecitabine to catnip trastuzumab regimen in that third line setting for most patients. The reason being that we haven't seen yet mature data from TDM1 to catnip, and I'm not really sure what the delta will be in terms of survival. And the huge advantage, obviously, for the HER2 climb regimen has been its ability to work so well in the CNS, and we don't have the granular data yet from HER2 climb O2. I think there's also the issue of toxicity differences. Um, you know, with the TDM1 to catna regimen, we did see that there was a pretty high rate of grade three LFTs, and the discontinuation rate was around 20% in that arm. And while LFTs we can usually deal with, you know, you need to, to hold and dose modify and, and you can, you know, make your way through it, it does cause some dose delays and, you know, is, is a little bit of a headache. Wow. Um, so, you know, I think it's a it's a tricky decision. I, I think the capecitabine regimen, again, just has more mature data. And so that's probably what I would stick with. I will say, though, that one question not really addressed in her to climb O2, and so not fair to really say, but could you use them sequentially? Um, you know, because what if someone progresses in the brain after capecitabine, trastuzumab, tecatinib, would you give TDM1 tecatinib? Could there be any benefit for continuation of tecatinib beyond progression in the CNS? And, you know, we haven't addressed this question. And just seeing, though, that in HER2 climb, or the original HER2 climb, that there was patients who got radiated in the CNS and continued and continued to have benefit from exposure to, tecat to tecatinib makes me wonder and so I do think we need more studies to address this sequencing question, which is now going to arise that we have different backgrounds. I feel like the sequencing question is coming about in every aspect of breast cancer treatment, especially <laughs> with the entrance of antibody drug conjugates. Now, though we have established in second line, TDXD has a great responsiveness. And with this triplet versus doublet is certainly the question. Now, the triplet diarrhea certainly is a concern where we tend to rely on uh, getting rid of capecitabine being the first one to be contributing to the diarrhea while continuing on with tocatinib and trastuzumab. Is that something that you would consider when utilizing triplet versus doublet, the toxicity profile, the age aspect of the patient? Though I know the, the benefit that we are seeing with is rather limited, but at the end of the day, we are so much used to utilizing TDM1 post Catherine trial in community setting uh, in adjuvant setting of HER2 disease. So one, as a community oncologist, we are a lot more comfortable from that aspect of TDM1. Yeah, you know, you bring up a, an excellent point that there are very different toxicity profiles. Certainly the GI toxicity with the CAPE to catnib trastuzumab regimen is not insignificant and we do often have to uh, dose modify as you point out, sometimes the cape, sometimes the catnip, sometimes both, right, um, to get the, it to be tolerable. You know, I think that TDM1 to catnip, I think is generally pretty easy. It's mostly laboratory abnormalities. I am a little worried, though, because we don't know how TDM1 performs post-TDXD. You brought up this issue of sequencing and ADC sequencing. You know, there's some thought that TDXD downregulates HER2 upon progression could that impact the efficacy of TDM1, where it is so reliant on having HER2 expression to work? My guess is it's a transient downregulation and it probably comes back up. But, you know, it does make me worry a little. So I know there are some providers who are reluctant to use a TDM1-based regimen directly post-progression TDXD. And so that may sway people a little bit towards the, the triplet 
uh, in the post-progression setting. But I really think we have no data about using any of this stuff post-TDXD, right? All these trials were done in a setting where these patients were TDXD naive. And so we don't actually know how any of this performs. Um, so it's, it's a tough decision. I think a few things yeah. to add on here uh, when we're talking about down regulation. That's the same thing that we potentially will run into trastuzumab with the triple therapy as well, saying should be considered completely different like chemotherapy, where I think tocatinib or capecitabine plays a bigger role in having that uh, hurt to backbone. The other thing we were talking about side effects, I think in general as a community oncologist, a few things to mention with TDXD, we have to be careful uh, about pneumonitis, nausea, fatigue. With TDM1, we have to be careful with neuropathy and thrombocytopenia. When it comes to capecitabine or tocatinib, again, hand foot syndrome from capecitabine and diarrhea. So these Medications have side effects and picking the right patient based on what the patient wants, what we're trying to achieve is so important. No, I totally agree. It is really critical. And sometimes these decisions really need to be personalized, right? You do have to have a discussion with the patient and see what you know they think um, is relevant to them and, and which toxicities they're most concerned about to, to be able to pick and choose. But nice that there are the choices for, for them. Yes. And I feel like as a community oncologist, we need to take the onus and get comfortable with these antibody drug conjugates because we continue to see them in bladder cancer, lung cancer, and now uh, breast cancer is definitely taking the lead here. Again, prior to closing, in second line setting, once the disease progress on taxane with HER2 directed therapy, there are options of TDXD to catnib, trastuzumab, capecitabine combination, and now TDM1 plus minus to catnip, though we'll have to wait for FDA approval on this and longer term data to really support that. But it is important to stress that, that this trial did include patients with active CNS disease where this population does get lagged behind. Sir, thank you so much for joining us and going over this practice changing data. And kudos again to her 2 Climbo 2 team for focusing on active CNS disease. Well, thank you very much for having me.